Perfect. All right, guys. So welcome to what is Movement Ayahuasca and a bit of an understanding of what Movement Ayahuasca is. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this one goes better than last time. Might be easier. I've got two screens now. Bam. Yes, it works. Phenomenal. Now I can see your faces and the screen. Beautiful. So I'm Richard Aceves. Uh, there's a lot of new faces on here. So I'm going to give you guys just a brief kind of introduction of who I am and what I've done. Um, I started coaching and working in the fitness industry after I was hit by a rock slide. I spent five months in bed. I was at 5,000 meters of altitude when I got hit by the rock slide. I uh, spent about 12 hours on the mountain. I was told by the doctors and the medical system that I would always be in pain, that I would not be physically active, that I would not be able to do much. So kind of get used to taking pain medications and learn to live your life in a sedentary way. Uh, from a very young age, I've been a kind of, I'm going to do what I want to do. So don't tell me what to do type person. And that's where my gears really changed into understanding how can I best recover from this and what can we really do with our human body? So I taught myself how to walk again. Uh, when I was told to go to the physiotherapist office, they were very, I was pretty far ahead of what they were having me do. So I decided to just do all of my own recovery. I've started and opened and operated across the gym for eight years with a corporate wellness program. Uh, after that, I went off and took off on the road and did seminars all over the world. Uh, educating coaches and people that are passionate about movement and getting out of chronic or acute pain um, for about seven years, almost eight years again, uh, still doing it. And in that process, I learned a lot about the depths of and the power that movement, proper movement, proper stress and proper breathing can do for the body. So a lot of what I teach is because I've had my own experiences when I find something that works really well for me, I go, hmm, I wonder if that's a coincidence because it's just me or if it works with a lot of people. I had the beauty of traveling. We were in a country every 10 days working with an average of 30 to 60 people. So I would test out all of my crazy theories and I was able to develop a big range of patterns that, you know, I hate to say it, but I, I haven't failed. <laughs> they seem to be pretty spot on every time. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Eastern side of things, my intuitive take on how I work with with people and a little bit of the Western side of things and the, you know, the neuroscience that is going behind it when we're talking about, you know, doing something as powerful as ayahuasca actively through movement. Uh, what what's really happening in the body and what is it that we're really trying to achieve? There's a, a big fad going around right now where everybody's getting into ayahuasca, everybody's getting into healing themselves, but it seems that this sort of healing and these labels keep building up more and more mental, I don't want to say mental illness, it keeps building less resilience of what a human is. I think we as humans are extremely resilient. And when we stick to only the cognitive side or we take away the stress and how to possibly positively adapt to stress, uh, we make humans less resilient. And so hence the word movement ayahuasca. Uh, movement ayahuasca came from doing, I was doing these seminars all over the world and we had a participant, a coach that came to see us to learn about how we teach people how to move and get out of chronic pain. Um, he had done ayahuasca because he had, he was a, an Olympic athlete. He was bit by a tick and got Lyme disease and basically his world crumbled and the medical, modern medical system, Western medical system had no solutions for him. His last resort was to go to a shaman in the Netherlands and did an ayahuasca trip. And three weeks later he went in to get tested and there was no Lyme disease. So I am by no means discrediting the power of ayahuasca or the root. I am on the board for a retreat program called Yo Soy with one of the top uh, shamans from Peru called Umberto. Um, we work hand in hand. I help a lot of the clients that go through an ayahuasca retreat come back and kind of get grounded again. Um, I've basically taken the the capacity to break down the ego and give sort of this enlightened version 
but then what do you do when you go back to the real world? So hence the name Movement Ayahuasca, because we finished a 90 minute session. Um, I have the video somewhere in the archives. I'll need to go back and look for it and, and I'll post it up. But this guy had this incredible movement experience. And he said it was a very, it felt like a much more directed ayahuasca experience. The ayahuasca experience was very broad. All the doors, kind of all the channels opened up at once. And I had to, I felt enlightened because everything kind of came at me at once, but he had a very direct, a direct goal that he wanted to, to, to achieve, a very direct objective. Um, I, that's not the most cases with, with what's going on now with ayahuasca. People are like, oh, I want to try ayahuasca because it seems like the cool thing to do for healing. And so there's no clear direction. It's kind of difficult. With movement ayahuasca, I'm essentially looking at the body um, it doesn't lie to me. I can tell exactly where you're holding tension and the patterns or behavioral patterns, how you perceive the world, how you react to the world. And that's what we're really trying to change. I'm nothing but a navigator. I'm here to help direct you in the direction that you want to go. I, I want to get you from point A to point B as smoothly as possible. Um, there will be some rough seas, but we will we will get there because nothing is served on a silver platter, right? This world is not kind. Uh, it's not what they're trying to say it is. It is an extremely easy world that we live in nowadays, and we do need some hardship. Um, and hence how I was able to create Movement Ayahuasca. If you guys have questions uh, throughout the slides or me talking and rambling and going on tangents, please ask, unmute yourselves and ask, or type them on the chats. I'll try to have the chat up so I can, I can pay attention to it. Um, I do much better when this becomes a conversation rather than just me trying to get a stroke of my ego to tell you guys what I know. So I don't know what you don't know. I want you guys to understand as much of this as possible. Um, so yeah, let's get rocking. Any questions so far? Easy peasy. Beautiful. Bam. All right. So before I forget, because I'm the worst salesman in this world, and there's something that I'm working with, I have two upcoming retreats for Ruben Ayahuasca. For Croatia, I have two spots left. I have one private room and I have a shared room. And then for Standpoint, Idaho in June, I have a few rooms left, quite a few rooms left. It's going to be pretty sweet. Um, as you can tell, they're extremely nice locations, which is part of the experience. And I'll explain that in the next slide. But if you guys are interested, go to uh, richardaceves.com and then you guys can go to retreats and sign up there. Or you guys can write to me a message and we can have a chat if you need some more clarification if, to know if it's the right place for you. Ms. Jody, do you want to jump on really quick and kind of talk about your experience before I explain everything? Uh, sure. Um, I, I'm throwing I, her on the spot. <laughs> Part of the test. <laughs> I handle, I'm much more resilient to stress. I will say that. Um, so yes, I, and you know, I think you teed it up very nicely. I did it was almost a year ago, I think this week, maybe that yeah. we did movement ayahuasca in Cabo. And I had worked intermittently with Richard um, and didn't really understand what I was getting myself into, but I just knew it was something that I wanted to do. Um, so I'm glad that you're doing this seminar to give people a little bit more of a clear picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it really was a, a, a very intense and emotional um, three days. And it's really funny because in the moment I didn't, it, in those days, I don't know, I didn't really fully understand or appreciate necessarily what was happening. There was a lot of, you know, I went for various reasons, but at the time also my father had just gotten diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and started to deteriorate very rapidly. Um, and I went thinking I was going to express some sadness, um, probably and and get rid of some, some past trauma. So I'd already done a lot of work, um, a lot of things to, to help me keep moving forward. And I, I felt like I was ready to sort of like shake things up and take a next step, um, and, and move, move past the past, if you will. Um, when I got there, it very quickly I realized that it was um, more anger that had to come out, which was really surprising. Um, and that was the overwhelming feeling for, for I think, most of it. 
I will say that I um, had some insights there. I came back feeling more open and much less stress, but it probably was nine months later, almost exactly nine months later that I think all of that plus the additional work afterwards. So when Richard said like you, you know, if you just do ayahuasca or you just do the one thing, it's really the integration pieces and, and the follow-up, I think that make the difference. So it was um, early January. So about nine months later, I had a huge epiphany and it, it fully came full circle to how much I've changed as a human being um, to the point where I felt it literally in every cell of my body that my belief system had changed dramatically. Um, and it was this really powerful aha moment that now even reflecting on it a couple months later, I can attribute very specifically to moments during movement ayahuasca. So um, I was going into just do like a regular um, warm up, like incline treadmill. And I had this song that I had used um, to help get me into a fight mode. So I and Richard could probably speak more to this, but like I I was avoiding intensity. So I was very much living my life in a pattern of sort of sheltering in place, avoiding intensity, trying to sort of keep myself at, in this like small box to minimize stress. Um, so during this, you do what's called the gauntlet, which is a very um, intense, uh, I don't, is it six exercises? Seven, seven six rounds, and- seven rounds of six exercises. So I change Uh it for some people, but around there. (laughs) Yeah. And um, on average, 5,000 repetitions. (laughs) A lot of them. And specific to sort of what Richard feels like, you know, when he does his thing that I still don't understand. But um, basically, this is a song I would use for that to get me into that fight mode because it evoked such powerful negative emotions. So like shame, rage grief, um, the whole gamut. And on this particular day, I got on the treadmill and that song came on and I immediately was filled with like love, hope, joy, happiness. And I, I had this initial thought that, you know, what happened to me before I would never, this person I am today would never allow that to happen. I would never be in the same circumstances. I have a whole new skill set, and that, um, I I wouldn't allow it. My next thoughts were that I didn't deserve the bad things that happened to me. And my next thought was that I actually deserve happiness and joy and love. And I got like a little emotional thinking about that because what that meant to me was that I've been carrying around that operating belief that I don't deserve, not only do I deserve bad things, but that I didn't deserve good for most of my adult life, if not all. And I remember specifically the moment in Movement Ayahuasca where that belief, the net, the wrong belief came right to the front of my mind. I just didn't know it. I think we were, it might've been day two, we were doing the anger frustration workout. Expression, yeah. And I was in like glute bridge position and we're doing the chest press. And in, in Richard's way, those of you that are new, he has a lovely way of being <laughs> gentle, but firm. <laughs> and you were in your passionate way, encouraging me, like, keep going, stop quitting, stop quitting. You deserve this. And in my head, I was screaming, no, I don't. No, I don't. And in that moment, like, I realized now that that was actually what needed to shift. So I didn't, you know, need to go in there with sadness, get rid of old things. But that was the belief that I really needed to shift. And I didn't even know that that was what needed to change. But that is ultimately what ended up changing. The other thing I would say is that I, and we de- we debriefed about this, part of the anger that was coming out was all self-directed towards myself. Like, why would I allow this to happen? Why I stayed, you know, stayed in a situation so long? Um, and through that integration process too, like what I realized was like, I I'm now looking at this as I'm looking first of all with myself with compassion, like what happened in the past, I have self-compassion now that wasn't there before. It was all like, I was taking it all internally 
And so a lot of the anger I was carrying was actually at myself. Having that shift has been huge. And then I also look at it now as a source of strength. Like in spite of all of that, look at how far I've come. And I never had that before. There was always this sense of, you know, I wasted so much time. I should be here. I should be doing X, Y, Z. Um, and there's a new element now of, of really excitement for the future, which has not existed for me. Um, so it's really shifted me in the respect of being able to be more open and, and actually look towards my future with a lot of happiness. Now that I'm not carrying around this core belief that I did, I sort of knew it was there, but I didn't really know it was there. Um, how that all happened, I have no idea, but again, there's very specific moments that I can attribute directly to like movement ayahuasca. And then the, in the time sense, like integrating those patterns, I've repeated the gauntlet. I've been doing lots, you know, lots of, we've been playing around with lots of different work, um, and, and movements to try to continue, um, to break, you know, those, the old behavior patterns. Um, yeah, yeah beautiful. So. And now we're here and I'll see you in Croatia soon <laughs> yeah. for another fun well, experience. Going back for Beautiful. round two. Can't get enough of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sh sharing, Jody. Yeah, I mean, listen, my philosophy, as you guys can tell, it's can we fucking enjoy life? Um, you know, we don't, we are handed a life and we have we, we we're handed circumstances and events that happen to us it's what we want to do with it afterwards that really starts to make a difference and the 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 biggest thing is i'm taking my own intuitive gut as a coach to look at what you need i am looking at a wide spectrum of different principles and theories, and there is no absolute. Uh, if I could write a simple system that could be structured and create an absolute out of it, um, it would be amazing. But unfortunately, that's not how life works, especially the human body. The human body is a beautiful ecosystem of feedback loops. So when I first started working with Jody, at first and foremost, I was extremely astonished at the amount of accomplishments she's had with her past. Um, and we have a podcast on that, so you guys can go back and listen to it. Uh, but it's it, it was amazing for me to see such a high-performance human being after what she's gone through. So I was like, okay, so what are the things that we're missing here? And as a basic principle for you guys to understand... You need physical intensity in order to have mental clarity for you to have emotional expressions, okay? We've been taught to cognitively think about how we want to change our behavior where the body does not work cognitively. Part of it works cognitively. A lot of it works physically. At a cellular level, it's called a cell danger response. You are working on a very efficient ecosystem that is trying to find its best way to survive and we're working with a system that is constantly reinforcing its learning and its behaviors so when you have been when you've had an extensive or an amazing like a, a heavy trauma or event in your life the body goes into a complete collapsed state. It plays dead. And from there, it tries to figure out how to best survive. That Changing that behavior requires as much, if not more stress than that initial event. Not the story of the event, just the stress of that event. The only way that we could do that without the crazy shock therapy and whatever else they used to test people out with, right, with psychotherapy, is through physical movement. So the reason it's taken Jody, it's been about a year and a half because we started working. It was about a year that we we're working solo uh, remotely. And then she went to movement ayahuasca. I'm not saying that I have the answer to all of your issues and problems. No, I don't. I, I have the capacity to, to, to diminish the, the behavioral, the automatic behavioral cycle, shall we say. 
So I can see where you can automatically, where too, where too much stress is going to overwhelm you. So it's easier to go to what's comfortable. And then from there, you decide to go into a reactive or I call it autopilot mode. And this is part of going towards Western science and looking at the, at the hierarchy of the nervous system and looking at the cell danger response. Again, we're a beautiful ecosystem that has this conscious and these feelings and these emotions. But for the most part, we want to survive. So talking about it doesn't fix anything. It's taking action that allows the change to take place. And that takes time because there is no linear progression that's going to get you into this beautiful aha moment. The goal is to understand that the shitty parts are also teaching you lessons <laughs> because that's the best way to learn. So I remember having conversations with George. She's like, well, I'm falling back. And I was like, that's great. You picked up on it before you were way down in the depths. I mean, at the beginning, she was like, I've been down for like three weeks. I was like, why didn't you reach out? She's like, well, I didn't want to bother you. I was like, that's the whole point. If you know you're going downhill, that's when you reach out and we can make the change. And now she's like, well, I've noticed the change. So I started to go down to autopilot. So I started to make this change and make this change. The goal for movement to ayahuasca is to have such a intense experience that we can create what's called a quantum leaping moment. We create so much physical, mental, and emotional stress that it's forcing you and allowing you to see how you want to change your perspective and your perception of this world. That's the goal. It is not easy. It is not simple. And it is not passive. And I'll make sure that it's not passive, right? Because the body doesn't lie. I can tell exactly when people want to zone out and just go into autopilot and endure the remaining part of the workout or the day. And that's my job to go there and be like, no, 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 stay with me right? And we keep pushing forward. Cool. So we're, I used a lot of different principles from modern day science to old day Taoism and Taoism, um, looking at some Buddhist principles as well. So I, I, I incorporate a lot of everything. There is no absolute for me. And if anybody is trying to sell you an absolute or an enlightened spirit in a weekend seminar or something like that, kick them in the nuts and walk away. Like, don't, don't do that. I'm not, I'm, this is going to take work and movement to ayahuasca takes a lot of work and allowing you to be where you want to be is going to take work. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the, the journey across it, right? The, the whole point is that you are where you are today. Make the most out of every fucking minute because you never know a boulder can come down and smash you in your hip and you could be left on the side of a mountain to die, right? It could be a bus on the road. doesn't matter. Enjoy what you have today but we can learn to become more resilient and get the most out of life every day if we push physically first and take action. Okay, beautiful. Let's rock and roll. Bam. So expectations of the experience. First and foremost, it's the environment. I've gotten so much shit about the places because they are more expensive. I want to have a good experience. I'm not, um, you know, the even though it's called movement ayahuasca and it may seem like I'm a, a kind of hippie guy, I, I, I like nice things. I think that when you create a nice environment, it, it, it brings up a, a part of the human body that goes, okay, let's try a little bit harder. Let's push a little bit harder. I want the environment to be brand new and something unique. So every time that I bring up the environment, Remember that your behavioral cycles are also dictated, not just physiologically and psychologically, but environmentally. So the reason that I don't do it at my hometown where you can stay in your house and go home every day is because I want a completely new environment for your system to feel vulnerable, safe, or a little bit um, out of the blue, right? Something new. It needs new places internally and externally to explore. It likes the, the uncertainty is what's gonna bring the change. So for me, the environment is huge. If you guys saw the, the Croatia, this beautiful castle. When I did it in Mexico, it was a beautiful hotel with a private uh, harbor that we would do the workout then surrounded by the ocean. Like Idaho is gonna be a beautiful lakefront house. The environment is key to being able to change behavior. Because if you don't change your environment, it's very difficult for you to get out of autopilot mode. Cool. The next one is connection. So I'm going to force connection through Swami. I'm going to force connection through the gauntlet, through the expression of the id, through the acceptance of the self. 
connecting to yourself. And I want you also to connect to others. Um, I've changed a little bit since Jody did the, 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 the retreat. I like this kind of tight knit group of staying in a household and having to share food together and socialize. We've lost that in humans. We all go home to our apartments, eat. Sometimes we go out and eat out, but we're all usually on the phones texting or swiping or doing whatever you want to do. So for me, the, the point is we change the environment and we create connections socially and individually. So the big part of the experience is during the midday, right? During the morning to the midday when we're doing the work, it's about connecting to yourself. But then part of it is connecting with others afterwards, socializing, sharing experiences, being able to enjoy a glass of wine without counting the macros or the calories, being able to live in the moment. That's one of the biggest things that for us as human beings is so crucial. Next to sunlight and water, we have socialization. And then we can have food and movement and everything else. But in reality, socialization allows you to change a lot of your behavioral cycles because it allows the openness of perception. It allows you to gain perspective of everything around you and create a new perception of how you view the world. Cool. After that, we have expression. So a lot of the times we are choosing not to express how we feel. And that sends us into a spiral. So from a very young age, you like to explore. You're not sure what's right, what's wrong. Depending on your parental figures, you're either very strict or very liberal. The, the expression is always cut short when you're wanting to go into a fight or into a rage, usually because you're having a hard time, you know, regulating your nervous system. But as you get older, you have this capacity to conform to society and society, depending on the social circles that you run with um, and what you think you should be, how you should be behaving. Um, it's okay to be selfish sometimes and express the anger that you've lost a loved one. It's okay to express the anger that you're not happy about a certain part of yourself. It's okay to express the happiness and the joy that you deserve even though you had shitty circumstances, expression is key. So I look for walls that have been put up on certain inputs, shall we say, stressors coming in, and you not allowing that expression to go out. So very simply, if you're having low back pain in this call, if it radiates through the entire low back, I guarantee you have a hard time truly expressing anger. If it goes more and radiates more towards the left side, you're an extremely empathetic person. You're an extremely strong person. You think that you can take the whole world on. You're the rock, the anchor for people. And you take on all of their energy. And you have a very hard time expressing that anger outwardly. If you have it more on the right side, the world is just pissing you off. And you have a lot of frustrations that you've been told that you shouldn't express. And therefore, the energy gets stuck on your right-hand side. If you're having pain in the sacral part of your tailbone or going down towards the deep kind of the spine and then you have the sacral bone if you have discomfort pinpointed there there are more than likely some extremely repressed or blocked out memories or you may have in a some low libido and a lack of expression sexually and primally okay so Again, the body is very good at holding energy where it needs to in order to change behavior to see where it can express and where it cannot. And so this is where the emotional mapping comes in and how I can look at the body and tell you exactly how you perceive the world and how you will react to certain stressors. So at the base of it, expression is gonna be key. We're gonna express things that are in layers. So if you were to think of a, of a big ball, that would be the superego, how you want the world or how you think the world perceives you and how you want to behave. You have the ego, which is sort of going back and forth on should I express this, should I not express this based on if the superego is bigger or smaller. You have the id, which is part of the primal thoughts, the primal behaviors, the repressed memories and thoughts, which create certain uh, behavioral cycles. And then you have the true self. The true self is that inner child they talk about in cognitive therapy uh, and some somatic therapies. So my job through movement ayahuasca is 
trying to break down all of these layers to allow the id to express itself and to allow the innocent you, the true self, the, the inner child to have a clear view and a rebuild out. Because you may have been conditioned to behave a certain way. And that's just done over and over again with parents that, you know, were trying to do their best to raise you or maybe not doing their best to raise you with incidents and events that have happened that start to create these blockades. These blockades are communication going to muscles. And this is where movement and ayahuasca come to play, right? Movement being the key point. I'm bringing neural connection to muscles that hold information about how you react to the world. And the best way to change how you react to the world or in these sort of behavioral cycles is through allowing you to express and gain massive neural connection to a certain muscle. And then from there is acceptance. We like to create acceptance. I call them justifications through a lot of cognitive therapy. And by anybody listening here, I am no, by no means uh, diminishing cognitive therapy. I think there's a great place for it. And it's a great point to start. And there's a lot that could be done through cognitive therapy. But at the end of the day, you do need to have some physical expression of what has happened, right? And I think that if you guys are in the group that are doing a lot of physical movement and training, psychosomatic therapy is not enough stress, again, to rechange the prediction of the events that have happened, right? The predictive model of how the brain works. So when we talk about acceptance, I'm not talking about the cognitive sense of acceptance, right? So as Jody was talking, there was still a lot that she's starting to just now create acceptance towards because the body is starting to create these, these new prediction models at a cellular level and cognitively is not catching up. The cognitive brain is actually extremely slow compared to how, how the nervous system communicates and how cells react and act. So it takes a while for it to catch up because the cognitive brain is the smartest. We're trying to conserve all the energy for the brain and not really paying attention to how the body works. I pay attention to how the body works. I change how the body works. And then eventually the train of thought starts to change cognitively. So rather than doing 20 years of therapy, let's do two years of fucking proper movement and stress. That would be my take. I will say that. Cool. Beautiful. From there, we go to the gauntlet. My favorite part. So when you guys come to Movement Ayahuasca, when you try, start having this experience, the first thing is, let's have a chat. What is it that you want? What are your expectations? How can I help? What are we going to do here? Um Usually for me is I have a conversation with each person and I see what is the role that I need to fill? Where is it that I need to push buttons? Uh, from a very young age, I think I was I was groomed to be a, a movement shaman. <laughs> um, but essentially, I'm very good at finding openings and buttons and gaps in how you like to justify things. And I will poke at those buttons to bring you to a lack of justification. So the whole point of the gauntlet is to kill the ego. So same thing as ayahuasca, it's the ego killer and it creates enlightenment. This is done actively. So basically what I do is I assess people very quickly based on how they're sitting, how they're talking, how they're moving, where the body is holding on to tension. I ask about points of discomfort. If there's physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, um, you know, what are these behavioral cycles? Are they more analytical? Are they more emotional? Where is their quitting mechanisms? I'm taking all of this in as we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And from there, I create a workout that is individualized for you, even though we'll all be working out in a group. And the point of this is to create a massive amount of neural output into certain muscles that will no longer allow you to justify your true first thought of how you can create change so the ego is usually extremely big it creates a there's a big barrier to getting to the true primal self we cannot get there if we do not break down the ego first you will always find justifications and again you're thinking cognitively no i'm thinking physically so the way that you're moving the way that you're breathing there's a lot of different ways there's a it's what's called the selfish brain theory the greater the less, the greater the stress, the greater the lesson learned. 
So it takes five steps. You have boredom, anxiety. Anxiety can be physically or mentally. Frustration, usually an emotional pedestal. Anger at others, and then anger at self. Once you get angry at yourself and you understand that all of these justifications have been you just bullshitting around, not wanting to make the change, we have a quantum leaping moment. We start to learn a new lesson. The body can start to create different chemical reactions based on the observation of its environment that it's walking through. It becomes more resilient. Okay. So the ego killer, the point is we're going to do a lot of work and I'm going to show you exactly where you quit and why you quit. And then we'll have a conversation about it. So the whole point here is to get rid of all of the justifications that you have in your brain. It's going to create a very direct line of where you should be put, putting your attention to. A lot of the times we like to put our attention to what the society, the superego thinks that we should work with first. That usually tends to overwhelm the system and you go right back to, right? So you have anxiety about wanting to fix yourself and then you get depressed because it's too overwhelming to try and fix. It's too many steps. So we find ways to reverse engineer that all through movement. From there, we create what's clarity for the id, right? So that primal self has certain things it wants to express that it hasn't in a long time. There's been labels placed on you. There's been identities placed on you. You've victimized yourself by saying, I have ADHD, or I have this, or I have that. I am this, or I am that. Shut the, you, no, who are you? So the it has a certain sense of self that wants to express, but because of conditioning from the parents, from the mentors, from the X, Y, and Z, from the environment, you've chosen to shut it more and more and more and more down. So for me, is I'm going to bring that id, that primal self out as much as I possibly can. And next up, we create a bottom-up expression. So this is a buildup to that bottom-up expression. A bottom-up expression means that rather than me saying, I'm going to move this way, the body says, I'm moving this way. You go, what the hell is going on? And then you have a bottom-up expression. So rather than cognitively trying to understand your environment, your body speaks louder than your mind, and you're able to have an expression of how you're truly capable of acting in that moment. Cool. And then after that, I'm able to see the roadblock. So depending on how connected or disconnected you are, you may have a huge epiphany moment. You may not. Um, and I can have these conversations with you and I will tell you exactly where you were feeling the stress, where were you feeling discomfort, how you were doing it and how you were displacing your, your system, right? So again, as a human, you think, therefore you are, but you are, therefore you think. You have a lot of systems that come before the cognitive brain can make a decision. So you're seeing things. Is this place safe? Is it not? Are there threats? Should I be hypervigilant? Should I play dead? Do I need to bring myself down? Do I need to go into autopilot because it's so safe that I don't need to worry about it, right? So I'm driving to work and I hope I didn't kill anybody because I do this drive every single day. So seeing is part of a system. Hearing, talking, breathing, taking a sense in, tasting, being able to feel with your skin. There's a lot of skin receptors that are actually picking up a lot of pheromones and theramones and so on and so forth to make sure the environment is safe. That forces you to create certain roadblocks when the body is extremely comfortable being uncomfortable or being stuck in these cycles. Holding your breath, elevating or down-regulating the heart rate, moving with inconsistent tension through certain muscles, uh, pacing, going out too hard at the beginning, trying to sabotage the whole thing, um, X, Y, and Z, talking, grunting, creating this big show of screaming, crying, and shielding, and blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of different ways for you to displace tension. The point for the gauntlet is I give you the guidelines that you need so that you're not able to displace the tension and you're being forced to, to face what you need to face. Cool. Questions? Easy peasy. Awesome. From there, we have the expression of the id. So this is day two. Now, mind you, all of this is being coupled with Swami. So we do morning cardio and active meditation. We do Swami sessions. And then we have an expression of the id, which I've changed. So Jody, you're going to be in for a, for a fun one. Um, so expression of the id is this. We broke down the ego walls. We kind of crashed ourselves pretty hard the first day. Second day we come in, we're going to express our primal selves. Um, 
again, you've had labels, victimhood, uh, you call yourself this, your identities that have been built up, all of these false senses of how you truly wanted to behave in certain events, this is your time to express them. And I do this by basically buffering the nervous system, I call it. So this is part of the polyvagal theory and the phylogenetic hierarchy, going from your most modern nervous system to your oldest nervous system. So going from the ventral vagus nerve, which is part of socialization and coordination and movement and coordination and planning and strategizing through action to the sympathetic nervous system, the being hunted, the fight, or being hunted, the flight, the winning and taking action and conquering without thinking, just moving to having to complete these strategies on how to get out of this situation. And then we go to the dorsal vagus nerve because nothing else works, so we play dead. So I buffer this through the gauntlet and the swami sessions and the active meditations. I go to the id, and now we buffer between flow and fight, flow and fight, fight, flight, fight, flow, fight, fight. Right? We keep bumping through these through these stages to a point where the body just wants to let go. At this point, we're able to express all of the past fuck use that you've had stored up in your body. Um, I always say movement is a way for your body and your nervous system to say F you to past events. Breathing is a way for you to change the state to how you want to feel. And nutrition is a way for you to, to react or be preventative to how you're going to feel. If you're going to work out, have sugars, have fruits, have nuts, have carbohydrates and fats. If you're going to recover or go to sleep, have proteins and fats, some vegetables, some fibers, because you're going to go down, right? So really, this is the best way to, to think about it. Movement is really allowing you to say F you to past events and start to change the prediction model or the reactive model of how your body observes its environment. Cool. The second day is also learning to win a fight. You might think that you're being intense in your workouts. You might think that you're winning the workouts. If you go back and really start to pay attention, most of the times you end up at quitting or sabotaging yourself, again, through one of these five states, which is boredom, anxiety, frustration, anger at others, or anger at self, before you truly fail or before you truly win. Right. Like you've never quit a work, not quit. You've never stopped a workout three quarters of the way through going because that was fucking that's what I needed. I'm good. Started laughing a little bit, giggled and walked away and felt great. You always have to go until you're absolutely destroyed. Or you create the objective. I'm going to run a marathon. No matter what. Did you really win the marathon run? You've completed the objective. Did you learn a lesson in that objective? Some have, some haven't, right? I'm not saying that, they're, that you're always failing, but for the most part, what I've seen within our society is that we've learned, we've been taught and we learn and teach our bodies, our reinforcement learning mechanisms have been taught to lose and to stay in a flight state where there's high cortisol, high anxiety, or taking you towards what's called retarded depression, which is essentially a sympathetic freeze, panic attacks. So, the point of expression of the id is to teach you how to win, how to feel confident that you've dominated this workout, you've dominated this weight, you've dominated this movement. I don't need more. I don't need to prove anything else to you, right? I don't need to prove anything to the weight. I've destroyed it. And it's not really the weight. In reality, what the body is going is it's saying, fuck you to past events. Going, I don't need to prove anything else to that version of myself. I'm over it. I've defeated it. I have a new sense of self. I will be able to express. Cool. We create self for we create space for our truest self to shine. So this win allows the body to go, hey, it starts to actually regulate a dysregulated or dysfunctional nervous system. So once you're able to regulate the nervous system, which we will we have been doing for the past two days, we're now essentially allowing the true self, the inner child. Um, you know, uh, Grammarly always wants to correct me to the most authentic self, but I fucking hate that term because I feel like it's so overused. So I like to use truest self or your true self. This allows that part of you to shine. It gives you a glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel of, okay, that's where I want to go. It's not, I am there because you've just started the journey. 
that's where I want to go. And now the work begins. Cool. And then it teaches your system how to express. A lot of us have a really hard time expressing, whether it's in the gym, whether it's with relationships, whether it's with the boss, whatever it may be. We have a hard time actually saying what we want to say. Myself included. I mean, it, you know, it's always a learn. It's it's lessons being learned, right? And so as you start to go, once you learn to express, what you're doing is you're building safety within your system. You're building confidence within your system that now allows you to express or perform outwardly. So again, physiological, psychological, and then environmental. Bam. And then we jump into the third day, acceptance of the true self. This is a little bit of a lighter day. We go through Swami meditation. We kind of have some new guidelines. We understand the light at the end of the tunnel. Now we start to make stepping stones towards it. So we gain new predictions from self to the brain. So rather than thinking, I think, therefore I am, and writing these affirmations on your mirror and high-fiving yourself, which do help, but don't do nearly as much or take much, much longer to achieve what you want to achieve. We're going to gain new predictions. Why? Because for the last two days, I have forced so much physical intensity that it has overridden the stress of past events. So this comes again back to a Western neuroscience study, the hierarchy of the nervous system and the cell danger response and the quitting or the selfish brain theory. There's usually eight steps to changing the system. And it all goes towards the hierarchy of the nervous system um, Essentially, the nervous system is the highway to how you react to the world and how you perceive the world. It has eight steps. The first five steps are passive because the brain wants to, the cognitive brain wants to have most of the energy of the body. So most of the steps that are happening through the nervous system are auto-regulated or extremely reactive. We're 80% afferent, reactive human beings. I'm forcing that 20% to come out to change how you react for that 80%. Does that make sense? So by doing so in those next two days, this third day is allowing you to create acceptance of what has happened and understand these sort of new prediction models that are going to start to take place. Again, nothing in life is linear, and I wish that I could change your entire world in three days, but it is going to take work because you are gonna go back to old environments, to old relationships, to old connections, and your body goes, why do I need to do all this work when I know that I can survive in this shitty environment by doing autopilot shit all the time? It's just, it's plain and simple. It's, it's, a, it's a survival mechanism. So it is going to take work, but the good thing is that we have a blueprint going forward. Cool. We gain clarity on who you are. So now it's up to you. Do you want to actually make the change or not? Again, I'm not the captain of your chip. I'm not promising anything. If you go back home or like what you see now that people listen to 10 podcasts a day, but it's all just information and no action is taken. There's actually MIT came out with a study. It's called the GI Joe fallacy. Essentially, it just says knowing is not even 5% of actually doing. Right. So we all know we shouldn't have Snicker bars. I ate a Snicker bar today because I was starving and I was like, hey, I remember I was I was primed correctly with the with the hangry U.S. commercials of people eating Snickers. And I was like, I'm going to get out Snickers. Right. So knowing is not even five percent of the solution. That's just information. But I've given you the wisdom and the knowledge and the tools necessary that when you get home and shit gets hard, you could make the changes if you want. Now the body's going to fight very hard. Not even the mind. The body, the mind's going to go, what the fuck? I know I'm going downhill. Why can't I change this? Why can't I change this? And yet the body keeps doing its own fucking thing. It's an up and down thing. It's called the well done control function. All we're trying to do is minimize the amplitude of mistakes little by little. So if you're used to having these cycles of the world's against me every single day, we'll change it to every three days and then eventually every six days and then every nine days and then every three weeks and then every nine weeks and then every two, every six months and then every two years. It's going to keep happening, but the amplitude of mistakes will be minimized. That is the goal. There is no perfect living and there is no perfect healing enlightened form. Uh, you could say the Dalai Lama could be the one, but I'm sure that he still had his learning mistakes, right? We're human beings at the end of the day. Cool. So from there, we create a game plan and then we just go enjoy life. Like, let's just go live our life and have a good time. Woo. 
And that is my speech, guys. <laughs> any questions, comments, concerns, anything that you want clarification on or any of the symptoms, any of the days or any of the workouts that, um, uh, what do you want me to repeat, Mike Ramirez? I, I didn't see that, dude. Sorry. And now we're 20 minutes late. <laughs> it was all good. You actually touched right back into it and it was the five stages. And then I was curious what you had shared about the breath, but you touched on everything. Um, uh, okay. I did, since I'm here, I do just want to add something. So I went to Rich's workshop when he was still affiliated with Strong Fit in like 2018. Um, and just to share, everything I picked up that week, I tried to integrate. And because I tried to do it so aggressively, I never, ever, ever actually integrated anything. So <laughs> my body over the course of the few years completely shut down. So I constantly got into worse pain. And it's only through the last probably like a year and a half where it wasn't even the work. It was the expression of rage anger that helps me get back to my body. That's finally allowed me to start training again, feel good, come out of depression. Um, but it took a long time for me to break a lot of walls of resistance. Um, so yeah, man, I'm just excited to still see you growing this thing and how much work has gone into it um, and look to be hopefully at Idaho. And if not next year, dude. Love it, bro. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that, was a, an, that was an intense week. <laughs> so this is Super. part of the, I'm learning things. And here comes my premier is thinking that he's going to learn how to get people out of discomfort and pain. I'm like, Oh, you have pain in your lower back. Let's, let's try this out. <laughs> and it was a big expression. That was a, it was an interesting expression. I, I, I don't think it was actually me. It was uh, Ray Regno that was doing the, your assessment at the time. Right. Um, yeah. So there was a lot of epiphany moments that I've had. Um, and, you know, again, taking what you think is knowledge, but in reality, it's just information and transferring it to that knowledge and that wisdom where I was able to apply and, and see the, the evolution just by seeing people go through it. So it was a, it was a whole lot of fun. Cool. Questions, guys, comments, concerns. This is your chance. If not, we will call it there. Uh, I, I had a quick question, Richard. Yeah. Talk to me. Um, just in terms of if we do sign up, between now and June for Idaho, is there a suggested route or path through which we can uh, begin to prepare in order to get the most out of the retreat itself? Um, start doing Swami. Okay. You know, it's it's uh, through my years of, of coaching and teaching people, it's not that I don't, it's I give you extreme credit for your body being extremely resilient and being comfortable in its path, <laughs> in its cycle, shall we say. So um, I would say just doing Swami sessions, start to practice Swami, um, start to move a little bit, have a good time. Yeah, it's I, I read the body for where it is when I come, when when I see you, I understand a little bit of your history, but for the most part, I meet you where you're at for that you know, in that moment, and we have four days to really build up. There's no perfect road to go on. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try to, once you sign up, I'll try to have more communication back and forth to make sure that you understand some of the crazy concepts that I talk about. Um, but other than that is, yeah, once, we're, once you're there, then, then we'll really get to work. Start doing Swami, I would say minimum one hour a week. If you can, if you need to break it up, okay. But, you know, I would try and say five minutes every day, once a week, try and get, you know, 30 to 30 minutes to an hour of it. Um, you know, it, it sounds daunting when you think of the gauntlet and you're going to be doing 4,200 reps, but you're thinking of a gym workout where I'm going to be explaining like a CrossFit type workout or a gym workout where I'm like, I need you to get the dumbbells from here to here. That's not what I care about. I care about movement and more importantly, the tension to the right muscles. So if we're pressing and I see that you're going to the trap the whole time, I'm more than likely going to come up and I'll put my hand here and I'm going to start to just force you to press here and back down until we can get this movement. And then I'll start to build up the range of motion. So for me, it's, you know, I've had people that are extremely deconditioned show up and it's just, it's, it's time under tension that allows you to create the new prediction model. So what's the right, right thing to do before you show up to Idaho? Um, 
start doing some Swami so it's a little bit less work on me or it's a little bit easier for me to see exactly where you're displacing because once you get to Idaho, I've been playing with some new tools as well and and um, we're gonna I'm gonna definitely be poking around and changing things up. <laughs> Thank you. For sure. And Chris, I think that's also um, answering your question. Perfect, guys. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Anything I can clarify? I just want to say uh, I really like what you're doing. And, um, yeah, I won't be able to make it to a retreat, um, at least in uh, the next two that you were posting about. But I really appreciate what you're doing. I find it really interesting. And I love what you were talking about on the Mark Bell's Power Project. And um, just I've been taking in a lot of um, – moving movement and breathing and breathing into movement and been really enjoying that so just want to thank you and uh awesome I really appreciate it yeah absolutely man always here to help um schedule for the next year so right now i have croatia and then idaho i'm thinking about doing one in bali uh but there is no set schedule for it yet um i may be done for 2024 and then maybe i'll pick up in 2025 again because it's just the whole lot of work. We'll see. If there's a lot of interest, then maybe I'll go into into Bali or do another one in 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 Europe somewhere. We'll see. Uh, absolutely, Fabian. Beautiful guys. Last questions. Good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate your time. Uh, I will be posting this on YouTube, so if you guys want to go back and kind of look at the at the outlines and everything else and kind of take notes again you're more than welcome to cool peace guys have a good one